Testing one, two, three. podcast was created to shed light on different societal issues which have been at the forefront of public discourse through one of the most divisive times in American history. More so, it was created with the intent of allowing those that have often been neglected, shunned, or misunderstood to have a chance to share their experiences and thoughts. I hope this dialogue encourages critical conversation and activism amongst all listeners And I hope you'll tell all of your friends and family about it and share it on your social platforms. Now, let's get into some current events. How did we end up with fast fashion? Where did this come from? Perhaps uh, the answer is in uh, the ability of companies to deliver uh, fashion faster and faster. You know, with the ability to deliver inexpensive clothes because they're made uh, in places where the costs are the lowest and they can be turned around uh, with the the fastest speed possible and um, change uh, weekly or monthly. Maybe that's uh, just from having that capability, you end up with fast fashion because you know that satisfies a, a desire and a need in people. If that's the case, then it's that that desire. With, from the consumer that's driving it. And that's where the change has to come from. Patagonia, the outdoor company, is doing what they have to do in combating climate change by donating $10 million to environmental programs. Y'all, I only own one thing from this store, but they're about to get some more of my money because this is great. I mean, I need other businesses to take these initiatives just like Patagonia has. It doesn't have to be necessarily that big, but we all need to get on board because climate change is real and it's affecting us. And although the president of the United States might not want to acknowledge that, amongst a lot of other things he doesn't want to acknowledge, this is something that needs to be addressed because it's literally going to kill people if it doesn't get addressed. Anyways, the company... Save the money from the irresponsible tax cuts from the Trump administration in 2017 and were propelled to make such a generous statement after Donald Trump denied a recent climate change report. I mean, honestly, y'all, what has he not denied? He denies everything. Anyways, the nonpartisan report warned that if climate change is left ignored, then substantial damages to the U.S. in regards to the economy, environment, and human health will occur. This isn't the first time Patagonia has pledged to fight climate change, being that in 2017, they took legal action against the Trump administration for shrinking the size of Utah's Great Staircase Escalante National Monument and Bears Ears. The lawsuit is still ongoing, but hopefully the argument of reducing these national monuments would be stealing protected lands that are crucial to environmental stability. So now we can go buy our ice cream. All right, make ways. Ben and Jerry's, as you know, has a three-part mission statement, product, social, and economic. And especially the uh, social mission part of it is probably why I've stayed with the company as long as I have. I like that. Our approach to social mission is to actually work our way from inside the pint out. So where we want to start is with the dairy. And so we made a stand on making sure that we support the family farmers from which we sourced our dairy so that they can have more sustainable, profitable family farms. And we work our way through the pint to the ingredients like sugar, cocoa, banana, uh, coffee, uh, vanilla, 
those five core ingredients are all fair trade certified. As we uh, get all the way to the packaging, how can this packaging be environmentally sustainable? So we get Forest Stewardship Council certified paperboard. As we prosper, they prosper. We want to use our business and our business model of linked prosperity to show that the communities where we're sourcing our ingredients from, where we're uh, selling our products, and where we manufacture our products are a part of the prosperity of our growing business. Patagonia is not the only major company committed to integrating activism into their brand. Ben & Jerry's actually has a social mission activism manager that helps the company incorporate political and social advocacy into their business. Currently, Ben & Jerry's is supporting the Poor People's Campaign, which is an economic justice campaign that was originally launched by Martin Luther King Jr., but cut short because of his assassination. The grassroots campaign aims to organize poor people to fight the triple evils of racism, poverty, and military spending alongside ecological destruction. I'd highly recommend you to go pick up some Ben and Jerry's, although if you know me, y'all know I don't like sweets, but still, they'll get some of my business and they should get yours because not only is their ice cream bomb, the initiatives they support are the ones that affect marginalized communities, which are the communities that need the most uplifting. One of the things I learned is that life is an evolutionary process. We are evolving. We will change and grow every year. And I hope that I never stop becoming. It's a title of promise. This is a journey. I'm 54 years old. I'm, I'm not done yet. I am still becoming who I am. In other news, Michelle Obama's memoir, Becoming, has sold as the best-selling book in 2018 in just 15 days, selling, selling almost 2 million books in just one week. Her book details her life experiences prior to the White House, what it was like being the first African-American woman first lady, and how life has settled for them after leaving the White House. And if you know me, I own like three or four copies because <laughs> my friends are the greatest and got me the book because I love the Obamas. I mean, literally, I have a personal letter written from them on my wall. I love them so much, y'all. Becoming has not only taken the U.S. by storm in sales, but internationally, it's the number one book in the U.K. and a bestseller in Australia, France. Germany, Korea, and South Africa. Not to be biased or anything, but if you know me, I have literally been in all this family, not only for the entirety of their White House stay, but also after and how they're still committed to being public servants and have shown a lot more of their authentic, carefree, carefree personalities on social media, interviews, and other entities. In other news in relation to the Obamas, they just signed one of the most lucrative deals with Netflix ever in which they will produce documentaries and scripted and unscripted episodes that focus on issues and themes during President Obama's presidential era. It'll be super intriguing on the content of these different episodes and how the Obamas will continue leaving their mark on America in and out of politics. With Michelle's new memoir and her repeated appearances on stage, we're truly seeing her at a peak moment in her personal life and can only assume that this will transcend in how her family's life is talked about for years to come. I mean, with all of the moves by the Trump administration to inadvertently erase the legacy Obama built during his presidency, I truly don't think we should allow these actions to forget how memorable Obama was while he was in the White House and how memorable he still is. Now, as much as I would love to talk about them 
And honestly, I just need to do a whole episode on... No, I need to do a whole series on them. But on this episode, I want to cover mental health. Because as someone that's gone through different bouts of depression and anxiety and still experience it at some times, I personally believe it's important to destigmatize mental health and seeking help for mental illness, especially in the Black community. Because within the Black community, it's something that's often overlooked or looked down upon. Nonetheless, the mental health stigma altogether is an issue that needs to be addressed within each of our respective communities. Growing up, I was raised in a pretty conservative Christian household. Nonetheless, after my parents split up, my mom allowed each of us, if we chose to, to go to therapy. I say nonetheless, specifically in reference to the fact that I grew up in a Christian household. And you'll understand why a little bit later. African Americans have been found to be the most religious culture over all other racial demographics with reasons going back all the way to to the fact that throughout slavery, African Americans found solace in religious practice. Yet, just like then, nowadays, black people encounter different mental illnesses like depression, PTSD, anxiety, and much more. But the reaction to these different illnesses typically go something like this. Just pray about it or give it to God. You all know what I'm talking about if you personally have gone to your parents and told them that you might need to go to therapy, you've been feeling depressed lately, you know that reaction. Typically, there is little compassion or empathy, not from all black parents, but from older black people in general when it comes to dealing with these issues. It also doesn't help that the access to educational resources, information on therapy, and healthcare disparities is extremely limited within the black community. Therapy is not cheap, y'all. And if someone literally cannot afford it on top of their basic necessities, how are they supposed to prioritize their mental health? They can't. Studies also show that even young adult, highly educated black people with a stable income are far less likely to go to therapy than their white counterparts. But why is that? What's the issue? Why is it so difficult for even those who might have the means to go to therapy? Don't. Historically, black people have been accustomed to rising above and being resilient throughout some of the most difficult times. I can specifically think of one instance that just happened in the mainstream media during George Bush's funeral when the Obamas were seen shaking the hand of Donald Trump and Melania. Now, obviously, I don't think they should have gone crazy at that specific place, but I don't think personally that black people always have to rise above certain situations. I mean... This man literally questioned the legitimacy of his entire presidency. So I personally don't think that you always have to rise above or be nice to those that belittle you, dehumanize you, etc. But anyways, during slavery, mental illness like depression, PTSD, bipolar disorder, although they may not have had a name at the time, were huge amongst the slave population because of the mental and psychological impact oppression had on them. Solace that came in the form of religion and the promise that slaves would eventually be free is how slaves essentially found their hope. Of course, there wasn't the availability and mental health resources that there are now, but it's important to point out how this stigma has gone back hundreds of years and the idea of Overcoming your struggle should be how you deal with your pain is still very prevalent within the black community. Now, while praying, like I mentioned above, 
may be a good source in which people seek peace and different affirmations like myself. However, in seeking help for mental illness, we as a community have to be proactive in looking for different entities in the different situations we may find ourselves in. For me personally, praying about it did little to nothing in dealing with the problems that I had. I'm not saying that praying doesn't bring peace or joy or comfort or whatever else people are seeking, because it does, but it wasn't a long-term or permanent solution for me. So I had to go to therapy, which I still go to on and off when I feel like I need it. And it's extremely helpful and been very useful for me in not only my personal life, but now my professional life as a teacher and how I have to deal with specific problems my students might have. If you look at the stats, African Americans are 20% higher to experience psychological diseases like major depression, suicide, PTSD, and anxiety than non-Hispanic whites. 6.8 million African Americans had a diagnosable mental illness in 2018 alone. Factors like disproportionate rates of poverty, joblessness, and exposure to violence all play into this stat. The hate you give. The hate you give. The hate you give. Little infants. Little infants. F's everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mama and daddy were born in Garden Heights. Mama left the garden when she was a little girl, and she wants us to get out too. Daddy says our life is here, because our people are here. It's about a young black woman kind of finding her voice. It's about speaking up, being heard. It's really about family and community. Star! <laughs> What's up? Star lives in different worlds, her lower income black community and her white private school. Garden Heights is one world, Williamson is another. So when I'm here, I'm Star version two. She's constantly having to split herself into two parts in order to fit into both worlds. I have to hide who I am. When I'm at home, I can't be too Williamson. When I'm here, I can't act too Garden Heights. This is about her awakening, this is about her journey and really realizing I'm gonna be who I wanna be. That's all challenged when this really tragic event happens. Go back where he told you. Khalil, I'm not playing, go back. <laughs> what did you do? The Hate You Give book study that I get the privilege to teach at my school, we had an impactful discussion the other day of violence on minority neighborhoods and the lack of resources provided for kids, specifically in high poverty gang areas. We talked about how the main character, Star, sorry this is a spoiler alert if you haven't read it or seen it, witnessed her best friend get shot and killed in a drive-by at 10 years old, and then was witnessed her other best friend get shot and killed by a police officer at 17. Her response to the shootings included night terrors, vomiting, and isolation at some point, because like the first shooting, when the second shooting happened, instead of seeking psychiatric help, she used her own methods of trying to find healing and understanding. While psychiatric help may not be the end-all be-all solution for some people, for a lot of people, it could be a significant step in handling the disproportionate rate in which African Americans encounter psychological diseases and destigmatizing mental illness altogether. I would highly, highly, highly encourage you all to not only read the book, but see the film as well. The Hate You Give is very insightful in looking at the violence that impacts black neighborhoods and how our mainstream media perpetuates different stereotypes about that violence. It's incredible, y'all. I'm super proud of how my students have been able to take this book apart and really look at different hidden means, meanings and themes that the author wanted to convey. So 10 out of 10 would recommend. Go see it, go watch it, do it. If you need a copy, let me know. I'm sure I have copies under my desk. Anyways, it's also important to acknowledge that mental health is not something that's always black and white. It's a continuum. 
and people can fall anywhere on the spectrum. Even when you might feel like you're doing well, it doesn't necessarily mean you're mentally healthy, which is okay. You also have to be aware that there are some things that simply are out of your own control when it comes to your own mental health. Genetics and significant life trauma both influence one capacity to which they'll encounter mental illness. But establishing healthy habits even before these traumatic events can occur could be super beneficial in improving one's mental health and preventing further illness. Healthy habits like the amount of sleep you get, having a well-balanced diet, regularly exercising are all useful behaviors that promote a healthy emotional well-being. I can definitely attest to that. When I'm doing all of these things, I know not only feel better physically, but emotionally as well. Even getting rid of destructive behaviors like self-pity is valuable. Watching the way you talk to yourself and about yourself can be a very insightful tool that I think everyone should practice because we, if we all started to be a little more kind to ourselves, I absolutely, absolutely think it would coincide with how our mental well-being affects us. Destigmatizing mental health illness, not just within the black community, but in each of our communities is critical because of the impact, the shame with having a mental illness is having on different demographics. Educating others that those with the mental illness are not a burden and unlearning the negative bias that we all may ha might have towards mental diseases has the potential to improve the reputation mental health has. Providing all communities with more access to prevention, treatment, and recovery centers, expanding the mental health workforce, and investing in preventative research are all culminating factors that have the capability to reform the opinions and perspectives anyone may have about this issue. It's extremely important that we talk about this, you all, because it is okay not to be okay. I hope that this episode was informative and thought-provoking for all that listened and for those that will listen in the future. I hope that you all begin looking at mental illness through a lens of compassion and empathy because more people deal with this than we talk about. I hope that you all will begin looking first at your own emotional well-being and take proactive steps to reach a healthy mental state in whatever form you see as best for you. By doing this first, we can begin unlearning the idea that having a mental illness should be equated with weakness when in all actuality, the people that can look at the pain and traumatic experiences they've been through and decide for themselves that it's okay not to go through it alone are actually some of the strongest people we will meet. Remember, all of these opinions are my own, but they should be everyone else's. Have a woke Wednesday. Thank you for another Woke Wednesday. Transcripts of entire episodes will be available on the Woke Wednesday website. Episodes are written and produced by Hannah Mason and Trey Leonard of Lenico Entertainment. Episodes are hosted by Hannah Mason and edited by Trey Leonard. All graphics are designed by Anna French, 